Welcome back to the Traders Network. I'm Michael Yorba, your host. Just wait till the music comes down a little bit. Thank you. And uh, this is the Women's Power Hour with Mona Lisa Como, uh, president in Paris Capital. And she's got a guest. Mo- Mona Lisa, tell us about your guest you brought to the show today. So, uh, Christine, are you on? I'm here, Mona Lisa. Hey there. Good morning and, and welcome to the show. T- today, folks, we have Christine Brecht. She is the founder or co-founder and president of Texas Wall Street Woman and also co-founder of Longstone Capital Advisors. Uh, Christine is very well known on the Wall Street side for women in business. Um, she's a great connector of people. And amongst juggling running a company, running to a Texas Wall Street Women with a host of folks that she's brought together, which is a really strong team, she also has her CFA charter and just about every FINRA license. Enough FINRA licenses, Christine, to get you in trouble, correct? <laughs> Keep me out of trouble, Mona Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, thank you, Christine, and welcome to the show. We're excited to hear uh, more about you and your story. Yeah, well, Christine and Michael, me. you're welcome. Welcome to the show, too. Uh, please uh, tell us about the women uh, in business, but uh, you know, the, the greatest transfer that our, our mankind is about to see, <laughs> no pun intended. Oh, you're talking about the the wealth the wealth transfer that we're in the process of right now. Yes, correct. right. You're yep. an expert on this. You've seen this coming for some time, correct, Christine? Well, you know, it's it's interesting because um, when I started Texas Wall Street Women, I've been in the financial industry for some 25 years, and just you know, following the articles, it, we really are go, going through a sea change in the industry. Um, the uh, the Boston Consulting Group says that women now earn a combined $29 million worldwide. Um, $3 trillion of that is in the United States. Uh, even though men still earn more, women control three-quarters of all purchasing decisions. Uh, they control 60% of all investable assets. And here's another small fact for you. Did you know that since 1982, women have earned $9.1 million more associates bachelor's and master's degrees than men. So with women making up 50% of the population, 51% of the population, demographically we outlive men, there's just a sea change going on in terms of what's going to happen in the financial industry. Tell us about that. Well, I think if you look, um, I think it was the um, Boston Consulting Group did that another study and they asked women how they felt about their financial institutions. And fully 78% of them said, you know, that they were not satisfied. It was a real black eye for the industry. And I think, yeah, I've had conversations with Mona Lisa in terms of when women get control of their assets, the majority of them are actually firing their financial advisor. So, what, what has been a very historically stable industry in terms of percent of you know men and women in it, this is now becoming a real issue because women have say, say they would prefer to work with a female advisor taking control of their assets and how they want to be serviced by those firms in terms of education, receiving information on investment choices, savings, and all that. That's, that is going to go through a major change. So, Christine, when we talked about this, I thought I think what was so interesting about the, this number is, first and foremost, is the timing. Isn't it something within the first two years, their financial advisors, is, I think 80% of women fire within the first couple of years? So it's not, That's it's not like That's there's a long, yeah, it's not a long relationship. And when you've talked about it and looked into this, the, the main reasons that women were, were, you know, letting go of their current advisor, despite the length of you know, tenure that they might have had with their husband or the family. What what were you hearing were the biggest reasons? Was it was it a chemistry? Was it they respect, or they just wanted to do something different? Well, I think I, I think what's interesting is I think you know women's from what I've read, women's approach to money doesn't necessarily fit the existing molds. So men like to talk about research, transactions, performance. Women are very interested in coaching, savings, support. Um, their risk tolerances can be different. Um, you know, one of the. Oh, as you know, let me, least, let's stop right now. That I need to explore. Their risk <laughs> tolerances are different. That's a big. That's a big issue. 
Michael well, being a traitor, it's, it's yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, got a, I've got a good friend of mine, and she runs a very large wealth management practice at UBS. And she certainly, she deals with lots of, but, you know, couples. And I've seen this in my, my own relationships where, you know, my husband may want to trade some of the money, whereas I'm very focused on long-term asset allocation and just and leave it alone. And my friend, one of the things that she came up with was, you know, put 5% of your assets in kind of a mad money account. And, you know, if the husband wants to trade that money, you can. And that's a good way for, you know, the couple to say, okay, this is the amount we're comfortable with trading and taking more risk with versus my style, put it in long-term asset allocation and let the markets do what they do. Mm. So that- yeah, wait, let me let me jump here on this one. The one thing that I've noticed that I think that, that the industry, the investment industry, really is completely behind the curve, as a matter of fact, they're in the grave on, is the level of education that we give to women on how to actually be more sophisticated with their own money, how to hedge, because if, if risk adverse is a big deal with women more so than men, like the, the profile that you put out, that they, men are more, they need the mad money. They want to they want to go for the 15 to one, swing for the fences, but the women are more concerned, and rightfully so, where is it going to be there when we look back? There's been a real, real pothole, if you will, in the industry for not educating women on how to use the sophisticated hedging techniques so they can actually save the money in what we could be in a, you know, a two-year pullback. And who's so letting it ride without using these hedge fund concepts and educating them, I, I think is a real problem with the industry. And it's male-dominated, so I could see that there would be a problem on that side. But I just want to throw that two cents out there. I think that that is a, a lacking part for women. Well, and I think, I think, Michael, you hit on the right word. The word is education because I obviously I'm a CFA charter holder, and when I talk about an asset allocation, I would include hedged assets in that asset allocation. I just might, because maybe because of what I do all day, I don't feel the need to add, you know, trading a portfolio onto what I do. But I think the, the key is, and I think this, you know, we are moving from a defined benefit pension society into defined contribution society, and I think the key to that for everybody is education. And I think you're absolutely right. I think the financial industry needs to do a better job in terms in terms of that education. Um, you know, I I've heard I've had a 401k at my last employer, and we got a little pamphlet, and that was it. And if I'm you know a car mechanic or a brain surgeon or somebody else, and they say, here's your pamphlet, there's investing. You know, this is something I've been studying for 25 years, and investing is, I, I like I like in, investing as an art, is that the concepts are very simple. Becoming Warren Buffett is really difficult. So, you know, anybody could, I could hand anybody a, a canvas and paint, and you could paint, but to become a great artist is a different thing. Uh, but I think that level of education, especially moving into a defined contribution society, that level of education from the industry really needs to increase. There need to be more resources. Now, fortunately, the Internet and shows like yours, there is more information out there that people can go get. But as an industry, I think we need to do a better job in terms of communicating it, especially because men and women do learn differently. And so it's, you know, how do we put that information out there and do a good job to reach the entire audience, just not 49% of the audience? So following up on that, Christine, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions for women uh, investors? Um, you mentioned how the, you know their strategies tend to be focused on um, growth and maybe savings. Is, is it because of a perceived uh, misconception on what they have to do with their money in order to invest it? You know, I think all the women I know, I, and I know some fabulous women investors, some of those, yeah, I know successful investors of both genders, and I think one of the key things is making investing accessible, that this is not something that is hard, the concepts are not hard to understand. The practice of it, like anything else, is, requires application, but just making it accessible that anybody that, that applies themselves 
applies himself to this can learn it. And then I think the other half of it is finding a trusted advisor. So if this isn't going to be your full-time job, having people who are willing to spend the time educating their clients. Christine, my, Christine, I, I hate to interrupt you. We've got to go to a break. Hold that thought. We'll cover it on the other okay. side of the break, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. We'll be right back with Christine Breck, Managing Partner, Lone Star Capital, Lone excuse me, longstoneca.com. And special thanks to Monk Media and 1-800-PUBLIC RELATIONS for all their PR and media support. We'll be right back after this with a lot more with Mona Lisa and Christine. Stick. Welcome back to the Traders Network. I'm Michael Yorba, your host. Thanks for joining us. We're broadcasting to you live from the Dallas KFXR 1190 AM Clear Channel Studios, streaming on the iHeart app and yorbamedia.com. This is the Women's Power Hour with Mona Lisa Como and her guest, Christine Breck. Christine, thanks for coming back with us. When Before we left on the break, uh, we were just talking about some of the misconceptions for women investors since there's quite a bit of transformation of wealth to women. And you were just talking about the trusted advisor being a part of that education process. Uh, could you continue with that? Well, I mean, that that, re that really is the whole thing in, in finance. I mean, we are an industry that is based on trust. And I think it, serving your clients is understanding your clients, understanding how they think, how they approach things, and meeting their needs. And that's, that's where trust gets built. So do you think, Christine, kind of continuing on that theme we talked earlier in the first segment about just in general, um, you know, women – uh, having the transformation of wealth, but also firing their trusted advisor, so to speak, within you know the first two years, about eighty percent of them, from what we what uh, what we've seen on the statistics, do fire their trusted advisor. But at the same token, you know something that that you care deeply about as well. There's not a lot of women in the financial services industry. It's getting better, but definitely not to the percentages to to take care of all of the women investors. Could you give our our listeners kind of an uh, understanding of the demographics of women in Wall Street and, and where you see we can move the dial there? Well, you know, I think it's interesting you say that because I think, you know, the, the perception is, is that there are not a lot of women in finance. Women are over 50% of all the employees in banking. Um, you know, personal financial advisors, that number is 25.7%. And so what, if, you look at, if you look at the industry, it, it really is a pyramid. I mean, you've got at the beginning, the majority of the employees are, are women. Um, if you go into accounting, that number is 62%. It's what happens as you start to, to move up the food chain, and certainly, you know, personal financial advisor is not an entry-level position. And so the question is, is that what's happening to that pipeline? If women are earning more of the degrees, they're the majority of the employee, employees of the entire firm. But then you look at Wall Street today, there's not one CEO, woman CEO of one of the big banks. And so where are the women dropping out? I think what's also been interesting to me to see is that, you know, a lot of these institutions spend a lot of money on improving diversity. And I'd say their ROE in that area has been lacking. And so the question becomes, you know, what's happening in the pipeline in the industry that, you know, women start out as the majority and are just are falling out. Why? You know, Michael, I don't think your radio show is long enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, how about the, how about the top two reasons why? Well, you know, I, I think it's I think it's a combination of things. One of the things I've seen in my career and I've been very lucky, I've had a lot of mentors, both male and female, um, is that. So, you know, part of it, it's, a, it's always when, whenever there's an issue, it, it, there's a two-way street, and there have been a lot of articles done on this. Part of the financial industry being su a success in finance is having a strong and deep network. This industry thrives on that. That's how this industry grows is, is who, you know, who you know, who you meet, mm -hmm. and speaking up. And I think women can do a lot better job at self-promotion. On the other hand, one of the the thing, the studies that have come out is that when firms say we want diversity, they put one woman in, and it becomes less of a priority. 
and in essence that process gets stalled so it, you know so it's, the, it's a lot of different things but i think the brilliant thing is is that we're having these conversations is that people are starting to recognize that you need more women on your team and 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 how do we how do we solve this problem that's no, no you put it well i want to i want to turn this a little bit if we can because we never did get a chance and, and briefly because i i do want to get into uh you know women in wall street you know and and, and what that is all about uh, you, the but i also want to give you just a moment to because we didn't even do this give you a chance to tell us what longstone capital does and then what you do with uh, women in wall street okay absolutely thank you so longstone capital we are what is called a placement agent um, I've been doing this for the last 14 years, and it's basically, you know, finding exceptional fund managers and marketing them, helping them find institutional investors, find good investors. Um, I'm actually working with a reinsurance-based fund right now. We were lucky enough to have Berkshire Hathaway come in as a January 1st investor. So this has been one of my most fun projects I've had for quite a long time. Um, in terms of Texas Wall Street women, I actually moved to Texas about nine years ago. And what was happening, I was meeting different women in the industry, and I realized none of them knew each other. And the organization really grew out of me meeting all these different women. And then there was, was a girls' school, series of girls' schools opening down here that we wanted to support both in terms of fundraising and bringing in um, volunteers to the school because these schools concentrate on math and science education. It's college preparatory for underprivileged girls. And what better marriage than bringing in women who use math for a living as mentors to these young girls to say, look, you know, we know you may not like to focus on your schoolwork, but here's what you actually get to do with it at the end of the day. So we started the group about six years ago. We are almost 1,800 members, and we put on events every single month in Austin, Dallas, and Houston. When's your next one? It is it, Well, the next one is on May 15th in Dallas. This is our biggest event of the year with over 300 people attending, and this is actually a fundraiser for the girls' schools. And, and the event is, is the state of the market? It's state of the market. We have some of the most brilliant allocators from across the state that will be giving their outlook on the markets, which um, looked like they were pretty happy last year and are now getting a little bit confusing. Um, so we've got Rhonda Smith from Houston Municipal Retirement System, Lori Dodder from Transwestern, um, Judy Morrill from a $26 billion wealth management firm in New York, Tom Tull, who runs the Employees Retirement System, and then we've got... Claire Farley from KKR and Kristen Colvin from MFS talking about the 401k market. That's an impressive lineup. And so, Christine, if folks want to learn more about Texas Wall Street women, um, where best to, to find out that information? Our site is www.txwsw.com or and, just Google Texas Wall Street women, you'll find us. And for Longstone Capital Advisors? It's www.longstoneca.com. Tell us about the milestones you want to cover or you want to accomplish with uh, Texas Wall Street women going forward. Well, you know, I, I, you know, it's interesting. When we started, we thought we'd be happy with about 300 members. So <laughs> we're a little overwhelmed as it is. Um, but, it, but I think really what it is, it's a, it's a forum to, to support women in their careers. Um, so we do the networking. Uh, we have relationships with a lot of the universities across Texas to give women who are in their graduate and undergraduate years exposure to different areas in the industry, and then really supporting these schools across Texas for the underserved girls. Um, you know, I always joke, we, until last year, the organization was run by all volunteers. So all of these events that we put on are done by women who are in finance, um, if you need something done, give it to a busy woman. Get out of her way. Mm -hmm. um, I am, you know, I, I'm, uh, you know, the president of the organization. But honestly, it's like our volunteers do just such an outstanding job and are have allowed us to accomplish what we've accomplished. So, Christine, from a, you know, one of the great things about uh, Texas Wall Street women to kind of continue on that vein is, like you said, the networking. And and one of the things I found that's been so powerful has been that network. 
Um, how can, you know, one of the challenges when I've tried to recruit women to, the, to, to that group as well is, is explaining to them the need for it. And so I'm hoping, you know, you could talk about why it's so important a little bit from the networking and what, what they benefit, because I, I think that continues to be the challenge. And mentally, it sounds great, but they're just not able to connect the dots and make the time for it. We, you know, it's, it, it, it's very interesting because I think that, and I've got a good friend of mine who is um, chief compliance officer at a firm, and she said that when she was growing up, she was a very naturally social person. And the whole thing she got all through middle and high school was stop socializing, put your head down, get good grades, and, and you know, Stay focused, everything will right. take care of itself, which is the exact opposite what you need to be successful in the financial industry. So is when and this was true of me too, because I'm you can tell I'm a very social person as well, is that what we need to be in successful in school, which is head down, do the work, your you know, your grades will take care of it. When you get into finance, if somebody didn't tell you that's exactly the wrong thing to do, you're in big trouble. Because if Chris, you don't, if for, especially Christine, for women, yep, go ahead. I, I've got to break in. I'm terribly sorry, but we're, we're running up against a hard break. I want to thank you for being our guest on the show today. Well, I'm honored to be invited, so thank you for having me. My pleasure. Uh, you've been listening to Christine Breck, managing partner of Long, Longstone Capital at longstoneca.com. And uh, special thanks to Monk Media and 1 800 Public Relations for all their PR and media support. We'll be right back with a special guest, Beth Goff, founder of Furnishing Vision, right? Mona? Yes, Mona Beth Lisa. Goff. We'll, we'll talk to you when we get back. Thank I will you. be right back. <laughs> 